Hello there and welcome back to The Closet Historian and back to my sewing room for another project. Now recently, as you may have noticed in my kind of weird video from last week, I've been doing a lot of color blocking or like kind of uh, almost quilting with clothing, lots of patchwork sort of things and uh, using strange materials in that kind of patchwork. And though I have been showing how I've been doing this on Instagram a little bit, I wanted to go ahead and make another video showing how I do color blocking using my basic block patterns, which you will have seen me do here on the channel before. If you have watched my Blade Runner inspired dress video, I can put a card out to that here. It was from several years ago. I think it was 2020 when I made that dress. And luckily I had enough time to recover from messing up the sleeve in that one to want to do color blocking again. Um, and now I just can't stop doing it, honestly. And so today I have the first of actually two videos making a skirt and jacket set. And today I'll be focusing on the skirt. So let's jump on over to the blue patterning table of doom and get started. Okay, so here we are. I have my design for this suit here. I have the front and back. So you'll see more of that next week with the jacket. But I have a tracing of my front and back pencil skirt or basic block skirt pattern here. You've seen me do um, or make this pattern from scratch here on the channel before in this video. So I can put that in a, up in a card here where you can see how I draft my pencil skirt patterns using directions from the pattern drafting book that I always use. But I'm going to draw a line straight down from this first dart in order to both eliminate this dart and then create that center front panel. And then I was thinking, you know, I kind of want that panel to be wider though. So maybe we'll do it from the center of this second dart. So let's do that. So I'm coming down the same distance uh, as the center of this dart away, all the way down here, because I want the center panel of this to be actually quite wide. So that's what I was thinking about here. And I'm just gonna curve off the end of that dart there and. When I cut those two pieces apart along this line we've just drawn, I will be able to eliminate that dart. Now this other dart, do I want to keep it or do I want to throw the same amount of fullness as that dart into this other one? And that's what I've decided to do here. So that other most forward central dart of this is another one inch wide. So I just added a half inch to either side of the other dart and then I will eliminate all of that when I cut them apart. Hopefully this makes any sense. Ooh. Basically creating a kind of princess seamed skirt pattern here. And in the back, I'm actually going to leave this other dart in the center. I don't know why I decided not to eliminate it as well I could. I was thinking, is this going to work? And maybe in a like very stiff, like woven fabric with no stretch, you would want to perfect this front dart situation a little bit more because I'm eliminating one of the darts and just putting it the same amount of fullness from that first dart into the second one. So I just have one bigger dart as opposed to two darts that are one inch each. I have one dart that's two inches. Um, hopefully that makes sense. So I'm just taking that first dart and shoving it into the other one. Now, for to perfect the fit on this, you would want to maybe do a mock-up. However, because I'm using fabrics that have a little bit of stretch to them, I'm not worried about it. So ooh, that does kind of allow me to feel like I can get away with not refining the fit too, too much. And now here I'm just deciding where I want these uh, like chevron stripes down the side to go. So I'm kind of just drawing them in below the darts area and figure out where I want those to be. I'm just using the width of my ruler to define those, which is two inches. And I've just chosen an angle randomly. This is not, you know, done in any specific way. <laughs> so um, I'm going to try and have, I think I was originally going to try and have three stripes in the front and then three stripes in the back, but I changed it halfway through. So we'll see how it goes. I made this a few weeks ago now. I can't exactly remember what happened, but let's find out together. The only important consideration for the angle is just to make sure that the angle is the same on the front and the back. It doesn't actually have to be the same, but for this, I just wanted it to be so. So I am making sure that the stripes will match up down the side seam when these eventually get put together. And I'm keeping the same length as ever. So nothing about the fit of this is changing, at least for the back. The front, I'm just switching that dart over a little bit. And then here, I'm going to come in about an inch on the sides. So from about like lower hip, like past all the fit stuff, I'm just kind of coming in an inch down the sides and just narrowing this pencil skirt a tiny bit. I could narrow this further, but I'm just coming in an inch on either side and narrowing it down a little bit. I'm realizing I was doing this very much kind of on the fly and not thinking about how I was going to explain everything as usual. So, you know, when I'm in the, the flow state of it, over here pattern drafting. Oh, and then I decided I want to do a side seam. So here I am deciding, let's do a side zipper and cut down the center back properly. So I will cut the center back of this on the fold and the center front of this on the fold and have a side zipper. I just, because I knew the center panels on both the back and the front were going to be in that kind of faux patent leather stuff, I decided it'd be nice to not have to break that up with a zipper. And who wants to sew a zipper into faux patent leather? Trust me, you don't, <laughs> believe me. But let me just cut the rest of this out, cutting down the center front here or up the center front of the skirt now. But again, this is just my basic pencil skirt pattern. The only fit change that's happened is narrowed it a tiny bit. And then this dart situation up here on the front of the skirt. I really need to do a proper gourd skirt because this is what this is technically. It's a six gore skirt. 
um, but of course I'm separating it in even more panels. And here you can see me labeling those. I like to, on all these little stripey bits, which are all going to get cut apart, label them a lot because it's really easy to get confused and turned around. Oof. So I mark my centers, I mark which way is up, which way is the side seam, and which pieces are supposed to be shiny fabric and which pieces are supposed to be like matte fabric. I will label the crap out of these pieces because it's like, I mean, you can imagine a piece, like number three piece down is very easily switched with number two piece down and things get confused very quickly. So again, anytime you add a style line, anytime you cut the pattern apart and you intend to sew it back together, you need to add seam allowance. So that's what I'm doing here. So I'm adding seam allowance down that center gore. And I'm just using my half inch seam allowance as usual for this. I am going to be using cotton PK today. And then it's a four way stretch spandex fabric with a sort of latex look coating. I think it's probably actually PVC, some kind of, I don't know, latex look, patent leather look coating that is on the four way stretch fabric. Um, that actually is like a black patent with a holographic finish. You'll see what I mean. But let me just tape the floops down here on our seam allowance so nothing gets out of the way. Um, and this, let's just Blade Runner suit 2022, label that a little bit, get it out of the way. And then here, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, so I don't get confused later. That's right. Now, uh, you could cut these apart and then add seam allowance, or you could add seam allowance all along the length of it first and then add seam allowance between the little panels. So I think it's easier to do this, add the seam allowance all the way down the panel like this. And of course, you don't have to put little extra bits in there. You could just have a paneled skirt that has a center panel and two side panels. And here I am messing up all over the place. What are you doing, kid? Tape that back together. I got a little too violent with my piece here and ripped it a little. All right, taping this down, adding seam allowance. But in general, most of the color blocked projects that I do, I'm just taking my usual patterns and you know deciding where I want panels to be uh, kind of by sketching and I, I'm just, you know, there's nothing uh, mathematical about where I put them. I just put them where I think they might look nice and uh, change fabrics and patchwork things together depending on what I think might look nice. The only consideration I really take in this kind of thing is trying to avoid having weird or hard to sew fabrics near zippers or closures or buttons might go. So like when I'm making a suit, for example, I wouldn't want to try and put buttonholes in again, latex kind of fabric. It's it just doesn't sound fun to me. So I do my laziness comes in in like there's areas where I think, oh, I could do that in the organza or I could do that in the shiny fabric, but I'd rather not. So I uh, will design around closures so that like the simplest fabric to do a closure in is where the zipper is, things like that. So um, even this here, I have to put a zipper in and it intersects with one of these stripes a little bit. And so I have to sew the zipper over the uh, shiny stuff. And that's not the most fun thing ever. So do uh, better than I do, honestly, at that last consideration. But yes, now I'm just cutting all these pieces apart. And again, every time I cut into my pattern, I have to add seam allowance. My patterns always have like standard seam allowance on them, but so like the top at the waist and the side seam already have seam allowance just built into them because my card patterns have it already. Already, But anytime I cut this apart here, cutting part E away from part D here, I need to add seam allowance to both to be able to sew them back together. So now I have all my seam allowance in. I'm just thinking about how I'm going to cut a little bit of an extra up here at this top piece to account for having a zipper up here. Um, I'm just going to do that in the cut. I'm not going to actually do that with adding extra seam allowance with paper. So now I've done the same sort of thing with the back, right? And I just need to, again, cut down these darts, basically cut this dart away. It's very similar to how, if you've seen me do princess seams before, very similar idea here on the skirt where you are just kind of eliminating the darts and putting them into a style line. That's what this is here. And again, I need to add, that's right, seam allowance along the center back panel the same way I did along the center front panel. So I'll be doing that. Now, when I do color blocking, my favorite way to do it, honestly, is using different colors or like finishes of the same exact fabric. So let's say I'm using cotton sateen or let's see for the um, Blade Runner dress that I've made here on the channel before that's in a card. I used all similar weights of suiting wool um, or maybe you could use cotton sateen in different shades or cotton twill in different shades, um, but like all the same like weight of fabric. And even that color blocked uh, PK dress that you saw in the um, shine lookbook it's all the same exact PK fabric from Mood, just in different colors. And that means it all responds the same way. If you cut everything on the same grain line, it will behave just like as if you cut it out of one piece of PK as opposed to, I don't know, dozens because I'm silly and piece them back together. And in order to maintain this kind of same stretchiness, same weight kind of a thing when using weird fabrics like I'm going to be doing today, I like to layer 
like the main fabric underneath all the other pieces. So for example, if you were making this skirt and you wanted to use, let's say, cotton sateen and an organza, like you have a sheer iridescent fabric that you wanted to use for the panels. Um, and the sheer lightweight organza fabric is going to be a much lighter, like floopier fabric compared to, let's say, a cotton sateen. And so I'm going to layer it over cotton sateen underneath. And so today I'll be using this weird four-way stretch spandex coated fabric, but I'm going to cut out every piece that I want to have that spandex shine finish. I'm going to still cut it out in the PK as well and layer that piece over the PK. So considering the weights of the fabrics when you're like uh, patchworking them together is important. So if they are of a very similar weight and similar like level of stretchiness, you can just use them as they are. But if one fabric is a lot thinner than the other, it's probably best to cut it out of the thick fabric and the thin fabric and just flat line the thin fabric with the thicker fabric so you can maintain the same sort of like fabric density around the whole project. Otherwise things are going to lay differently in different areas and it will cause problems. Also my chair is extra squeaky today so I apologize. I need a new office chair but that is on the back burner right now. Anyway I'm just doing the same thing that uh, to the back that I did to the front here so now that we're on this side panel I'm just cutting all the panels apart like so. And you can like add color blocking or panels like this to any of your patterns if you should so desire. Again, just remember to put seam allowance back on anywhere you cut it apart. And as far as fabrics I recommend for doing this kind of work, I would say cotton sateen or a lightweight cotton twill are going to be the best options. Um, today I'm using the cotton PK that I like from Mood. It is a little bit textured and thick for doing this kind of thing. Um, and the resulting like skirt it, you, you can almost stand up on its own. It like holds its own shape very well. Like if you've ever seen like pictures of corsets where they will stand up on their own <laughs> just because the shape is so stiff. This fabric is pretty, it's not even like that it's like super thick, but it's pretty stiff on its own. So, uh, and I will be layering the stretch over it again. So it ends up being quite a thick, stiff skirt. So it's a good thing it's a simple shape because it has no floop to it at all, honestly. Zero floop. And I, despite how much I like the look of the PK, because PK has a very like void look, it's um, not shiny at all. So I like the contrast between the shine, high shine of the faux patent leather and then the like very matte look of the PK. But I still think I would have rather have done a cotton sateen for something like this, just because in the end, the weight probably would have been better. But these, this is how uh, we learn these things, you know? And again, you can see I have labeled these back A, back like B, back C, back E. I changed color of pen, just another way to help me not get confused because of course these little, again, angled shapes for the back and the front look nearly identical and uh, you don't want to get it wrong. So again, labeling, labeling, labeling. You can see all my arrows on here. The two little arrows mean it's pointing down. The big arrow on the other side points up. Just trying to keep everything consistent. And I have two stripes, two spandex stripes in the back and three on the front, I think is what I ended up with. Maybe I just did two and two. I did two and two. So I cut it apart, you can see in the front here, I have A, B, C, but I just turned that into one piece because I decided to put the side zipper in and I wanted to have as little weirdness next to the zipper as possible. But here you can see I'm pinning all of this to the PK, even the sections that I'm going to end up making shiny. I'm just going to be flatlining those pieces with this PK so that the texture or like the weight remains the same. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and cut all of these out of the PK like so. And again, I lay these kind of, um, most of the time I actually lay them out in the basement floor in the room next to my studio because I don't have enough table space and floor space to be cutting on. The, I ha this table is the only table I have in here that has space for cutting. So if I need to lay things out, I have to lay them out somewhere else. But I like laying all these out and then, you know, looking at what needs to be cut out of shine, what needs to be um, cut out of my other specialty materials, just because it helps me see the puzzle, you know, from a top down view and not get confused, honestly. We can see this is all cut out of PK here. All that seam allowance is around everything that it needs to be. This front panel was cut on the fold and I'm separating what needs to be cut out of the shine fabric from the PK pieces that have already been cut. So even I'm here, I'm using pins to delineate which way is towards the center and which way is down. So all my pins are facing, like pointing down. That way I don't get confused with those pieces later because it's just, these little spiky guys are very easily confused. So here is my shiny, weird four-way stretch spandex. I ordered this online. The shop that I ordered it from ended up not being my favorite new <clears throat> shop because they, not this, this fabric was fine, but I placed another order with them and it was kind of a mess. So 
I shall not be recommending them. However, I did notice while I was at Joann's that they have a very fi similar fabric to this. So if you like this exact fabric, I saw one at my Joann's that was very similar. So, and then you can use a coupon and who doesn't love a coupon? That's right. But with this latex effect coated spandex, the back feels like swimsuit fabric because it is. And the top feels like a plasticky latex. And if you put a pin through that latex coating on here, it's basically kind of like laminated on. And if you put a pin through it, that pinhole doesn't go away. Now it's not very noticeable, especially in this black, but a lighter color you might be able to see. And so I'm pinning, making sure to pin only in the seam allowance. So stuff that will be encased later. And you'll see a lot of times I'm pinning like along the seam as opposed to perpendicular, like pinning right along the seam while I'm doing this today. Um, and that's again, to avoid putting holes in this coating on here, even though again, in this black, it's not that noticeable, but being thorough anyhow. And here I am lining up my little tiny chevron domino stripey bits here as well, trying to conserve as much fabric as possible. Now this fabric is four-way stretch um, and it is a knit as opposed to the woven PK. Uh, the PK has a little bit of stretch to it that is more uh, because of the blend of the fabric. This is because of the structure of how the threads are arranged, the difference between wovens and knits, something I've gone into a little bit before here in my textile videos, um, but they are quite different. And this four-way stretch is very stretchy as opposed to the PK, which is just a little bit of stretch. Um, so I can cut this without thinking about grain line, really, especially because I'm going to be flatlining it anyway. I could cut this any way that the pieces fit best, honestly. I could cut this on cross grain, on straight grain. It's not going to really matter, especially because we're going with this like latex kind of coating that definitely doesn't have a grain to it. But uh, some fabrics may have a little bit more of a grain to them. Like, for example, if you were using a velvet stretch um, fabric, then velvet probably has a nap to it. And you would want to pay attention to that. So now that I have my panels cut out of both the spandex fabric and the PK, I can start to layer those. Again, even the center panels here, I am flatlining with the PK so that, because this uh, stretch fabric is actually a lot lighter, like um, it's thinner than the PK is. It's a hefty-ish fabric. Like I made a skirt with just this iridescent, which you saw in the shine lookbook as well. Um, and it, it totally holds its shape and sucks you in all by itself. It doesn't need any under layer but I'm just doing this to keep the consistency throughout this entire skirt. And uh, yeah, so I'm pinning, you can see in the seam line margins here. And that is because I'm going to go ahead and just pin these pieces to their like flat lining, like pinning the latex kind of stuff to the spandex stuff to the PK. And then I'm gonna run all of this through my serger around the edges and that's how I'm gonna flat line this. Um, I mean, you could try and hand baste this but uh, again, this kind of latex coating on here is not very fun to like even pin through, let alone try and hand stitch through. So good luck to you. I recommend a serger for this kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I guess you could zigzag the edges as well if you didn't have a serger. That's totally possible. But I would recommend doing it, basting these by machine and flatlining them by machine as opposed to trying to hand sew them. If you're using a coated weird fabric like this, if you're just using a regular kind of fabric, it wouldn't be a problem. And again, if I was just using a different color of PK, if I was doing like a black and white uh, skirt like this and just using white PK and black PK, I wouldn't flatline those pieces because um, it's the same exact weight. But I'm only flatlining these pieces because they're two completely different textiles. One's a woven, one's a knit. And I, you know, we all know I don't work with knits. I have very little experience working with knits at all. So I'm flatlining them with woven so that I can treat them like a woven from now on and like not use any of the inherent properties of it being a stretch at all, honestly. So I'm just running these through my serger, turning this into a thick woven fabric, essentially. I don't really know how to work with knits. And other than those like pencil skirts that I've made out of just this fabric, you can see how quickly I'm getting turned around here. Oh my goodness. Where does that go? That goes over here. That's right. Uh, it might be worth actually writing on the back of these because you know how much labeling I have done on these pattern pieces would be worth writing on the back of the fabric as well. I mean, sure, if someone looked inside your skirt, if you didn't line it, they would be like, why is there so much, why is every puzzle piece labeled? But if you explain to them that you made it yourself, I feel like they would understand because it's quite a puzzle, no? So I have this centerpiece and then I have each side panel needs to be sewn together. So we'll start sewing, you know, piece number three to piece number four to piece number five here. Um, and I'm going to sew all these together with half inch seam allowance because of course we added half inch seam allowance when we were doing the paper pattern. And then I will press them open and top stitch them all because 
that's how it's, especially with a thicker fabric like this, I want the seam allowance to be held open inside. I'm not going to be lining the skirt, so I want it to be smooth as I can inside. And one way to do that is to top stitch the seam allowance open. So that is what I'll be doing with this today. And again, you can see I'm actually, I've switched over to my like fine pins here, which are all completely bent out of shape from doing all this work with spandex and latex and weird stuff now. Um, but I've been pinning just like in the seam allowance margins again, with as little pins as possible, just to again, avoid holes in the shiny coating if possible. But the 99K had no problem sewing this. Uh, even top stitching this particular fabric was no problem. Uh, sometimes you'll hear, you know, especially if you're sewing like real latex or faux leathers, a lot of times your presser foot will stick to them. The 99K had very little problem with this. I did use a larger stitch length when top stitching on this. So I like switched my stitch length to the largest size when going over the sticky-ish stuff, but this stuff wasn't too, too sticky. You get some of these spandex coated fabrics that like feel sticky to the touch. They stick to themselves. Like if you were to fold the fabric, it like sticks to itself and you have to kind of like peel it apart. And so like, if it does that, then you are going to need a walking foot or a foot like I think they have silicone feet that are good for that kind of thing. But you'll see here, my machine has no problem top stitching on this fabric. I just make sure I'm holding it like under proper tension as I feed it through the machine and it does an okay job of it. Other ways to get around this if your fabric is sticking to the foot too much is putting a piece of scotch tape to the underside of your presser foot. Um, I've done that before and it works pretty well. Um, not flawless, uh, the sticky tape comes off and kind of is, you have to like replace it halfway through the project and stuff like that. So it's not the best, but you can see here, this foot is handling this. No problem. Um, the other thing you can do is put a piece of tissue paper and put that between the presser foot and the project. Um, and then you can just peel the tissue paper off afterwards after it's been like sewn on. <laughs> Basically you're flatlining the seam with tissue paper at that point, but it's worth it to have it not stick to the presser foot. But luckily I didn't have to do any of these considerations because this one wasn't that sticky. I'm sorry, but I'm just, you know, pinning the next few sections. I'm going, you know, kind of bit by bit through this. So again, that I don't get confused. I'd rather go you know, one seam at a time, doing both the left and the right perhaps, and go one by one and not get confused because I hate seam ripping. So anything I can do in my life to avoid having to rip a seam out, I will do, especially in this where like, if you have to seam rip this, again, the stitch holes in this from the stitching will show in this latex coated stuff. So I have to be careful basically is what I'm saying. And you can see here, actually, I haven't mentioned, I'm using a piece of muslin as a press cloth when I am pressing this because the cotton needs a hotter iron than this spandex does. And so in order to not melt the coating on the spandex or the spandex itself, uh, I'm using a press cloth here. And because like, I assume this plastic would melt onto my iron plate, no idea. I'm hoping to never discover if that's possible, but I assume it is. So I'm just using a piece of scrap muslin here as a press cloth to press these seams open in the back. And then again, bring them back over the machine and more top stitching. And yes, I do go through a lot of thread when doing this because each seam is actually like sewn three times, the seam itself and then the top stitching on either side. And I am just using the small side of my presser foot as a guide while doing this, by the way, so that all of the top stitching is the same all over the project. But yes, I was very lucky that this fabric behaved with the 99, no problem. Um, that other, the first look from the Shine Lookbook, the wool dress with the front panel of like a faux patent leather, that fabric is extremely sticky. Um, so that one was very frustrating to do. And I did top stitching on that and I said, never again. Um, so I ended up using a little bit of tissue, that tissue technique for that because it was very mean. But by contrast, this almost equally shiny fabric, I would say this fabric is a tiny bit less shiny, <laughs> but uh, uh, was totally behaved fine with the machine. So, you know, it just depends on which fabric you end up getting and if your machine tolerates it or not, how much of a troubled time you're going to have, honestly. But with the center striped sections for each side panel now sewn for here on the front, I can go ahead and sew the tops on, the top and the bottom for each on like so, and then I'll be able to sew the long like central seam. And again, like that's where that dart that we added the extra fullness to was eliminated. So it kind of curves at the top to conform this skirt to the body. And with something as stretchy as these fabrics, I could have gotten away with like not having to have dart fullness at all, which again, I don't have darts in the front of this. I just have that dart eliminated in that princess seam, but like I didn't have to make it as curvy as I did if I wanted to figure out like how much stretch was in this that I could have gotten away with just making a tube that stretched around my body. But we'll do that when we get to the fully stretched skirts, okay? Today, we're still working with wovens. We've flatlined everything. Now we just have special effect PK, okay? 
and I'm treating it as such. And even here, I'm just top stitching again, as I did for the other panels. All the pa everything gets top stitched in this. All all things top stitched. I have to refill my bobbin all the time. And I finally learned I should just fill four bobbins with black thread and have them on hand. And I'll have a much easier day. But yes, I do go through a lot of black Guterman thread. I've learned to just order some, even if I'm not ordering black fabric. Anytime I order from somewhere that sells black thread, just get some because I use it so much, especially when I'm doing top stitching. But now that my two side panels, my front and left, my front and left, my left and right side panels for the front are all sewn together, are all top stitched, I can stitch them on to the center panel. Of course, again, the center panel was cut on the fold, so it is you know, twice the width of the pattern, I suppose. And I can go ahead and sew that long seam along the sides of the front here. And then again, I will press this seam open and top stitch it, that's right. No points for guessing that one, sorry. The singer did finally need a new belt after all the sewing I've been doing recently. So the belt on the motor of this buddy here, which is turning away no problem right now here, um, did finally stop gripping to the like wheels in the motor. And so I was having some trouble sewing last week. Finally, that belt had given out on me. I have no idea when that belt had been on there since. Like this machine is from 1955. So who knows when the belt was last changed. It was kind of cracking apart and sad old rubber. Wish you could get those original belts still like in new condition, but I ordered a few different ones online. Right now I have like the Singer branded uh, like universal replacement belt on it and it seems to be working fine. Um, but I was like, shoot. So I ordered a few to have on hand in the future because I don't want to be caught out like that again. We wouldn't want to have to use anything other than the 99K of course, especially when making futuristic garments like this. Just makes sense to make them on a machine from 1955. But again, here I'm using that piece of muslin as a press cloth to press that seam open using the end of my ironing board here to press open the kind of curved bit of the top. And then I will sew on the other side and do the same procedure all over again. Now for the back, I did leave that dart in the center almost as an experiment to see if you could sew darts in this weird coated spandex. So let's find out because uh, this center panel here, this you're seeing the back, which is the PK, but on the front it is, has been flatlined with the spandex now. So I'm going to pinch and pin this dart and uh, hope for the best in this weird spandex. Can you sew darts in stretch spandex? You shouldn't have to because it's stretchy, that's the whole idea. But uh, we're gonna do it today because I don't wanna sew with knits. I just want knits to act like a woven. And so I shall, you know, dart them into submission. But I'm just pinning those with my, again, fine silk pins. I'm pinning within like the uh, like meat of the dart because again, I don't want to have holes where these pins are. So you see me pinning down the center of the dart and then pinching it and like pinting, uh, and then still, even while I have it pinched, pinning only within like what will become dart interior, just because again, we don't want holes in this latex or PVC if we don't have to have it. I'm, they call it latex coated, but I'm guessing it's not actually like latex real rubber stuff. Just my guess. I bought this from like a random shop on Etsy again, so alas. I have no idea what it is actually made out of, other than what they say. They say latex-coated spandex, but can you test for if something is actually latex or not? I doubt anything's made of like real, like rubber tree latex anymore. Not when we have plastic polymers instead. Oh, and by the way, look, you can see the darts came out just fine. So it turns out that works, just so you know. And I've you know constructed the side backs the same way I did the side fronts with all that top stitching. You know, it took me a while, but we're skipping ahead here. And I'll just go ahead and sew these on to the back, just like I did for the front. Now, normally we see me do a center back zipper in nearly everything I make. Here I'll be doing a side zipper today. And in a skirt, I normally leave a slit at the center back as well um, to be able to walk. And just because I have side seams this time, I'm going to leave a slit in one of these side back panels. Uh, so that's kind of how I got around that. Just left the last like six inches open on one of these panels. I can't remember which one it is. I think it was on the left hand side. Yeah. And I did put my zipper on the left-hand side side seam as well, but we'll get to that in a minute. Here I am top stitching the seams along the back as well. You can see I'm holding the spandex kind of like taut, like pulling it away from the seam as I stitch along. You can kind of see what I'm doing with my hands here. And here's where that slit is. And I just continue the top stitching down the slit so that it looks the same and even matches the rest of the project. I assume this dulls your needle, this stuff too, and probably your scissors as well, because it's like weird plasticky weirdness, but I guess I don't really know. My scissors were already dull before I started making these projects, so 
These projects didn't do that. They were just were already that way. Here I am sewing the right hand side seam together. Of course, I had to match those stripes up along that side seam so that they will chevron properly in the end. And sometimes I get it exactly right on and sometimes I'm a tiny bit off, but I'd rather be a tiny bit off than unpick it and do it again. I'll tell you that much. But again, using that cloth to press that open, using lots of steam, hot iron, trying not to burn myself as usual. Although it has been chilly down here, so you'll see me like press open a seam with my hand, even though there's a clapper right there. And it's mostly because my hands are cold, honestly. So at this point, I'm just trying to warm up by doing that. But the seam is curved up here at the top where the hips are. So using my tailor's ham to iron that. Now on this side is where I've left myself a little bit of extra when I was cutting this out so that I can have a little bit extra here near my zipper. You don't technically need that extra. You only need the half inch, but I don't know. It, it brings me security to have it there. So I kind of left it there, <laughs> left it there for myself for little reason. And sadly, my zipper will extend into this stripe. Whew. What am I thinking? If I had thought about doing a side zipper before I designed the pattern, I would have put the stripes lower and then they wouldn't have interacted with the zipper. But this is the casualty of deciding I wanted a side zipper after I had already designed the pattern. Sad times. <laughs> but here I am pressing the seam allowance open. I've sewn the rest of the side seam down to the hem. And then I just left this top portion of the side seam open. I'm pressing the seam allowance back. And then I will just sew my zipper as I normally do. There's nothing really different about this. I know it's not a straight line. It's like a curve. But like inserting the zipper is the same whether it's on a curve or a straight line, actually, weirdly enough. And here I'm thinking, oh, how am I going to pin this with this like latex stuff? I'll just have to pin it and hope no one studies it too closely, you know? So I'm pinning this side of the zipper right next to the zipper teeth, like I always do. I will stitch that down over on the machine with my zipper foot. And then I will, again, use a lapped zipper. So I'll overlap the other side over this and stitch that down too. But here I am hoping, I hope this will stitch over this several layers through this sticky-ish stuff into the zipper tape. Uh, what a choice. If only I had decided on a side zipper before I made the pattern. That would have been wise. And, you know, or I could have just fixed it afterwards, but that would have required effort, which I was not going to do. Moving my zipper tab out of the way with my needle down so I can move that out of the way and then stitch the rest of this buddy closed. For some reason, this one was getting stuck. Rude. Cut it out. There we go. Nice. Stitch the rest of that. So now we have a functioning zipper. Just going to overlap this other side here. Again, it's curved, but that doesn't matter, I promise. Errant thread here. Of course, I can't even pin down there, basically, because this nonsense is so thick where that layer of uh, shiny stuff is. Oops. But up here, at least, I can put pins in. But you can see the, the procedure of doing the first side and then doing the lap like this. It's the same whether it's on the side seam or the center back or center front or whatever, wherever you are, essentially. And again, back here on the machine, doing this as I always do, trying to feel my way through these like thick layered fabrics. Oh my, once again, would rather do this in sateen now that I know just how thick this ends up being. Ooh. All right, and now that the skirt is all together, the zipper is in, I've cut myself a waistband that's a, you know, a couple inches longer than I need, so I have a little bit of overlap at either end. And I will stitch that buddy on along the top of my skirt here, making sure that nothing is getting caught in the wrong direction and such. Just because I like to finish my skirts with a waistband, you can also finish them with either a lining or a facing, of course, up at the top here. Um, but you never see me do that because I like a waistband. I, I feel like it helps define the waist, which is nice, or at least is usually what I'm going for. But I'm just using a plain piece of the PK for this. Going along. And then I will fold that to the inside. And I, you know, normally you can fold this twice. Like you fold it half inch and then fold it down to like really finish off the inside super clean. But because it was already so thick, I was like, I'm not turning this twice <laughs> and then stitching it down to where it had already been. Like the seam right now between the skirt and the waistband already has two layers. So like to add another two on top was gonna make it so thick that I decided just to surge the raw edge of the other side and then stitch it down on the inside. Like I'll stitch from the outside, I'm going to top stitch this down um, because the rest of the project is top stitch. Might as well just top stitch this as well. You can stitch in the ditch, uh, like stitch right over the seam line if you wish to as well. But because the rest of this was already top stitched, I felt no guilt in top stitching the rest as well. And I'll fold over the ends of the waistband here and I'll put a skirt hook on there eventually. But for now, I'm just folding everything so that it behaves. 
and then I will top stitch from the outside and I've just layered it a little bit underneath so that I know it will catch basically and uh, I didn't want to fold twice and hand stitch it down just because it was going to be so thick I couldn't do it to myself to the project it was too much once again hopefully no one will inspect the inside of my skirt anytime soon other than you like so I even just turn this a little bit with the needle down and just stitch the end of the waistband closed while I'm here. Whatever. The threads disappear into this PK really quickly anyway. You can't even see them. And I'm going to again sew that, that skirt hook here where this closes and then I can hem the skirt and this buddy will be finished. And when I hem this I just made sure that I stitched only through the PK layer where there was the shiny stuff. So there's no stitches showing on the outside of the shine. And here is my finished color blocked PK and strange spandex skirt. This spandex of course has this holographic iridescent finish that's more noticeable the closer you are to it or depending on the lighting. Of course my lighting here in studio I have lots of different colorful lights going on because it's me. But in reality uh, if you wore this out at night where there was lots of different lights happening maybe you could see the holographic finish but most of the time it just kind of looks like black patent leather and I really do like the chevroning down the sides of this. Despite this turning out rather heavy because of this heavy duty PK I do quite like this skirt. It definitely feels like it's holding me and it feels very secure. I hope you enjoyed this kind of introductory look at how I do my color blocked projects. The skirt is a lot more simple than next week's project. The jacket things go a little awry. You can hopefully learn from my mistakes but you'll see what I mean next week. Thank you as always for watching this video today and I'll be back here with more vintage fashion sewing, costuming, and crafting real soon. So I'll see you then. Bye.